for all of my sermons that I preach to be instructional. In fact, I believe that uh, most of what we do at a church on a Sunday morning ought to be something that instructs, that teaches. There's things that we do that seem more ceremonial or things that we, we always do, but really everything that we do on a, on a Sunday morning should be things that instruct, that teach, that help us to grow in our faith and knowledge. This particular sermon is going to be a, a pretty robust one when it comes to instruction and, and, and teaching of what baptism is about. We're going to take a break, as I had mentioned last week, from our study on John here for a little while. And, and over the next two weeks, we're going to look at our two ordinances of the Lord's Supper and baptism. And then after that, we're going to spend an extensive time looking at the book of Daniel, because especially as I see uh, the way that our world is going and some of the challenges that believers are facing here in America and abroad, I think Daniel's an appropriate book for us to spend some time looking at. Uh, so we'll, we'll jump into that. Well, this morning's sermon is going to be a little bit different than my normal sermons, though, and that typically the way that I preach is I will find a, a text of Scripture and I'll pretty much stay there the whole time. I may reference other Scriptures at other times, uh, but typically that's how I preach. However, a couple of times a year I'll typically preach a sermon that more has to do with a the theme uh, than uh, the, what I do normally is what's called expository preaching. And, and then where, we're, where we're taking out what's there and trying to understand it and then applying that truth to our life. Uh, and that's typically how I, I, I preach most of my sermons. But every once in a while I'll have a sermon that is more of a thematic, where we're focusing on a theme. And because of that, we'll jump around to a couple different texts of Scripture. I've given you a learning guide there so that those texts of Scriptures are there, so that you'll know where to go to. Uh, and if you want to pick up on them throughout the week, I would, I would highly encourage that as well. Uh, so we're going to start in Matthew chapter 3 this morning, Matthew chapter 3, looking at verses 13 through 17, uh, and I'll get there in just a second. Well, why do we celebrate baptism? Why do we do this? You know, we're a Baptist church, so baptism must matter to us, right? Must have something to do with something about what we believe, right? And typically one of the most joyous experiences that we have in the life of a Baptist church is a baptism celebration. In fact, I think that two of the most joyful experiences I've ever experienced in Baptist life are baptisms and potlucks. <laughs> right? <laughs> eh, maybe not, they're not quite on par. Okay, but that's usually when people are the happiest. Uh, I've noticed that people get the most joy out of those two particular dates. Some people might say, well, what about weddings? And I'm like, you know what, when you go to celebrate a wedding, you must have a lot of fun. But as the pastor of most of the weddings that I've ever been at, it's not always fun. In fact, sometimes it's very challenging. I, I made an agreement with, I, anytime I'm doing a wedding for a couple, I always make this agreement with them. And I'll say to them, I'll say, uh, when we're, we'll, we'll make up a plan and we'll figure out what the ceremony and everything's going to look like. And then I want you to give me that. And we'll make, a, we'll make an unwritten rule between us. You guys can change it at any time you want. But if anybody asks you, say, oh, yeah, the pastor, he has the outline, and he's not willing to change it for anybody. But if you want to go talk to the pastor, you can. And I explained to him my reason for doing that is, is that because that's usually coming from in-laws, you have to have them as in-laws during your time of being married. I don't. <laughs> For many of them, I'm never going to see them again. I don't care if they don't like me. <laughs> Weddings can be very stressful situations for sure. Well, one of the, as I said, one of the greatest things that we do is baptism, but we don't always do an adequate job of, of explaining why do we do this. And you know, th th that's an important question. So really we're going we're gonna to look at three questions this morning when it comes to baptism. We're going to start off and, and answer the question of why we do baptism. Then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how we do baptism. And then finally, we're going, to, we're going to answer the question, who should be baptized? And so that's really where we're going, those three questions this morning. And we're going to start here with, why do we celebrate baptism? Well, really, there's two aspects of why we celebrate baptism. One of them is an inward reason, and the other one's outward. And there's actually two under each one of those. So we have inward reasons for celebrating baptism, and we have outward. Let's start with our inward one. The first one, reason that we celebrate baptism is to follow Jesus' example. 
to follow Jesus' example. Okay? Again, look at what it says in Matthew chapter 3. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So Jesus comes to John the Baptist to be baptized. Now, what was John's baptism all about? Why was John out there baptizing? In fact, John answers that question for us in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Look what it says. John says this. He says, I baptize you with, uh, uh, with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me uh, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now there's a lot there that we're not going to, to unpack this morning. But what's important for our, for our purposes this morning is this. I baptize you with water for repentance. Now as we think about John's baptism, baptism, or, or what we would think of as baptism, was actually very common within the Jew and, Jewish faith. They were ceremonial washings. And they had various different reasons for having ceremonial washings. In fact, some of the places where the priests hung out, they would actually have large areas cut out into the floor that they would fill with water, so, and they would have stairs where they could walk down and then walk out. That wasn't so that they could have a public bath. It was so that they could be ceremonially clean when they went to go and do their various duties as a priest. So ceremonial washings was something that was very, uh, very common within that culture, but there was something different about John's baptism. You see, John was not just a Baptist. We call him John the Baptist, but John first and foremost was a preacher. And that's what people were coming to do. They were coming to, to hear John preach. And as he would preach, he would call them to repentance to turn from their wicked ways and turn to God. And one of the things, when they were ready to repent, when they were ready to turn, to turn, he would actually have them come and he would baptize them in the water. It's a way of saying, now from this point forward, I'm going to put the old way of living behind me and live in such a way to try to honor God. That's what John was doing. That's why when, John first come, when Jesus first comes to John, why he's reluctant. Why, why he doesn't want to baptize Jesus? Jesus shows up, and he's like, okay, now I'm ready to be baptized. John's like, wait a minute. I know you don't have sin. I need to be baptized by you. You don't need to be baptized by me. But Jesus says something very interesting to him. He says, thus is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. And really what, what he means by that, or what, what we can take from that, is this served as Jesus identifying with his people. Is it good that Jesus identifies with his people? Yeah. Yes. In fact, the fact that he identifies with his people makes it possible for him to be the bearer of our sins. You see, Jesus never sinned. But yet he could bear our sins because he identified with his people. And so he follows the example set. He goes and he's baptized. Jesus sacrifices what truly fulfilled all righteousness because he became one of us and died in our place. So Jesus gives us an example. We are baptized to follow the example that Jesus set for us. So that's the first reason. We follow the example of Jesus. If Jesus is our master, if Jesus is our Lord then we ought to follow where our Lord goes, right? Yeah. If Jesus was baptized, so should we be baptized. Next, we follow Jesus, or to follow Jesus' command. To follow Jesus' command. Okay? Matthew chapter uh, 28, and, and anybody who's been in a Baptist church for any length of time knows uh, that, that you're very familiar with, uh, with, with Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 and following. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. 
Jesus came and said to them, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. A couple things I want us to notice. We call this the Great Commission. As Jesus not only commissions this group of disciples, but really from that point on would commission all disciples, all who call themselves disciples of Jesus, that's all of us, to go out and bring the gospel to people as well. A couple things to notice here. Is it doesn't say that Jesus suggested to them. In fact, when he says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. He's starting off right away saying, this is why I can tell you to do this. I can tell you to do this because all authority on heaven and earth has been given to who? Jesus. To Jesus, right? And he doesn't make a suggestion here. He doesn't say, hey, if you get a chance, if you feel up to it, if you're in the mood, you might as well go and make disciples. Baptize those disciples. No. Jesus makes a command here. He calls them to do something. He goes, therefore, go. That's an imperative. Go and make disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations. And in doing that, Jesus gave a mission to his church. But it didn't stop there. He said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, why would Jesus command us to go and baptize? Why would Jesus tell us to go and baptize? Well, look again at the, at the end of verse 19. It says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we are baptized, we're baptized into the name of the triune God. We talk about triune God, we're talking about the Trinity. God reveals himself in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When we're baptized, we're baptized into the name of the triune God. We identify not just simply with Jesus, but we identify with the entire Godhead, don't we? And by being in that relation to God through Jesus, that's what's best for us. Jesus commands us to do this because it's what's best for us. You know the great thing about Jesus? Jesus never commands us to do something that's not good for us. In fact, Jesus never commands us to, not, to do something that's not the best thing for us. You ever been told to do something that you knew wasn't a good idea? Yeah. I've worked in some places before, before I became a pastor, where I had some people who wanted me to do some shady things. We've all been there before. Maybe when we were young, somebody said, hey, we should jump off this thing together. And of course, I was a young boy, so what was my reaction? Seems like a good idea. <laughs> We've all had situations where people have told us to do things that were not best for us told us to do things that were even necessarily dangerous. I remember one day, uh, when I was growing up, I was baby, uh, uh, well, we, my, my, both of my parents worked, so uh, we had a, a lady in, in town who babysit, uh, babysat us. She lived a couple blocks away from us, uh, and she had two kids that were, uh, or she had one kid, and then the neighbor kid were, was always over there, uh, and they were one year older than me. So you know what that meant? <laughs> Picked on me relentlessly. I was the young guy. And I remember one day, uh, Nathan, one of the guys, he goes, hey, hey, come with me. I want to show you something. And he was actually being nice to me, which should have been one of the first uh, indications to me that something was amiss. But I was young and I was excited. Oh, he wants to be friends with me. Okay. So I go walking into this room and I walk in there and all of a sudden, bam, I get hit in the face with something. The other kid shot me in the face with a BB gun. Sometimes things aren't going to work out well for you, right? Some of you are like, that explains a lot about what you are <laughs> No, just a little, little dot in there. It wasn't a big deal. You know, sometimes we're told to do things from people that are not the best things for us, that are hurtful, that are harmful. Jesus never commands us to do anything that's not the best thing for us. Amen. When Jesus commands us to do something, it's, it's what's going to be best. Sometimes it's hard. 
You better believe it. Jesus sent the disciples out. He didn't say, hey, this is going to be easy. Easy money. You're going to get out there. Everybody's going to love you. They're going to be excited to see you come into town. They're going to celebrate you. And you're going to make lots of money doing it. No. He didn't say any of those things. But he did command them to fall and to obey. And that even though they would be hated, that, they hate, that, that, that the reason that the people hate them is because they hated Jesus first. And that ultimately, when it comes right down to it, it's about being in good standing with God. And that's what really matters. Jesus commands this because it's what's best for us. So those are the inward reasons that we do it. We do it because we want to follow Jesus' command, and we do it because we want to follow Jesus' example. Now, if we're a follower of Jesus, if we say, I'm a Christian or I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Christ, I'm a disciple of Christ, however you want to put it is fine with me. But those first two reasons for being baptized should be enough. Jesus commanded it, and Jesus gave us an example. But there's two other reasons that I want to talk about, and both of those are outward reasons. First of those is this, to demonstrate an inward change in your life. To demonstrate an inward change in your life. Baptism does not save us. Baptism is not something that we do so that we can get saved, so that we can get right with God. It's something that we do after we've trusted Jesus as Savior. And that's because it's a picture of what happened inside of our hearts. Look what Paul says in Romans chapter 6. And I'm going to tell you, anytime that you say, you hear a preacher say, let's look at the book of Romans, know that we're getting into some deeper stuff. And this is one of those passages of Scripture, Romans chapter 6, that you would be wise to spend some time looking at on your own, because there's a lot there. And I'm just going to touch on a couple parts, but let's look at the whole thing, and then I'll touch on a couple parts. It says, what then shall we say? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all who of us who, were uh, who have uh, been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ has been raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him by, uh, in a death like his, we certainly will be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Again, there's a lot there to unpack, but what I really want to camp out on is a couple of things here. This tells us a little bit about baptism. It tells us that baptism is burial of our old self. Burial of the Lord itself. Again, look at what it says in verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Now, were any of us literally crucified? No, only Jesus needed to be literally crucified, right? Okay? But when we trust in Christ as Savior, when we recognize that we're sinners who need a Savior, and that Jesus is the only one to be worthy of uh, uh, be called Savior, and we put our faith in Him, what we're doing in that is the old sinful self is being crucified to that old sinful self. Not literally, but figuratively. So as we stand in the water, it's a picture of our old self. It's a picture of what happened inside of our body. It's like we're our old self. We go down under the water, and it's like a death. And then as we come up, we're risen to new life. Baptism is not just a burial of the old self. It's also an inauguration of the new self. Look at what it says in verse 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Amen. You know, when we talk about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we talk about salvation, most people immediately think about heaven. They think about, when I die, or when Christ returns, 
that I'll be with him. And is that good? Beloved, i got to tell you, that's the best news in the history of the world. That this life isn't all we have. Praise God for that. Amen. That is good to know. But you know what? That's not the only part of salvation. We camp out there, but you know there's more to salvation than that. Because there's another part of it also. We can walk in newness of life. The old things that used to be what enslave us no longer need to enslave us. The things that, 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 that once we live for, we no longer live for. Now, does that mean that we're, we're in some way going to never have temptation again? No. Guess what? All of us are going to be tempted. And all of us are going to be tempted in ways that maybe we were tempted before. And just because you were not tempted or you're tempted today with things that you were tempted with before does not mean that you have not trusted Christ to save you. Here's the difference. Before you trusted Christ as Savior, you were trusting yourself to save you. You were trusting yourself to be righteous. You were trusting yourself to stand before God holy and right, and you could never do that. When you trust Christ as Savior, you recognize, I can't stand before the holy God, righteous and clean. Instead, I point to Jesus, because Jesus died in my place. Jesus took my punishment. So each of those sins that I did, that I'm doing or I will do, Jesus already paid the price for those. That's what it is to walk in newness of life. So we don't walk running around with our chains anymore because Jesus broke those chains. We no longer walk as somebody who has to be righteous before God because of our own righteousness, because we'll never do it. It is only through the righteousness of Christ. Second outward thing, or reason for being baptized, is to demonstrate that you truly believe. To demonstrate that you truly believe. Now throughout the book of Acts in particular, we have example after example after example. In fact, we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, Acts chapter 8, verse 12, Acts chapter 8, verse 36 through 38, Acts chapter 16, verse 33, and many, many more. What we see there is that when people believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they followed him in baptism. They weren't baptized first. They weren't baptized so that they would believe. They weren't baptized so that their sins would be cleansed. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they were baptized. That's why we talk about being a step of faith. Baptism was and still is a visible proclamation that you believe and plan on following it. Now, there's an important part of that. Here's what it is. This is why I've had somebody ask me before. They said, well, can I just be baptized, just you and me, that, like, that, that you'll just do it maybe you know, just during the weekday? And I won't. I'll never baptize somebody by myself. Because it's a time that we do it in front of people. And it's not because well, I, want to, I want to show off. It's because in baptism, you're proclaiming that I trust Jesus as Savior and I want everybody to know it. But along with that, you're asking the church to help you grow in your faith. See, there's two parts of it. Those who are sitting and watching a baptism, you're, not, you're doing it passively in that you're not in the water with us. But the active part says, when I see somebody be baptized, I have a responsibility. As part of the church, you have a responsibility. And that responsibility is to encourage that person, to help them in their growth, to love that person, to care for that person, to get to know that person. So baptism isn't something that where we just passively sit back and think, oh, that's nice, now can I go have lunch? There's more to it than that. So I said we were going to talk about why. I talked about the why. Now let's talk about the how. How we baptize. 
Throughout history, there has been an argument between do we immerse people or do we sprinkle people? Now, in truth, historically, it wasn't until about the 9th, 9th century that people began to, to be sprinkled for the most part. There were times when people would be sprinkled, but usually it was because there was a lack of water or there was some sort of health concern. But historically, baptism has always been done through immersion. And that's why we continue to immerse people today when it comes to baptism. Why is that? Three reasons. One has to do with the word. The Greek word baptizo. Baptizo. It means to dip or to plunge underwater. To, to dip or to plunge underwater. That's what baptizo means. Also because it was the mode of the early church. That's how the early church did it. So we follow that example. But you know what? Those two things, as important as they are, are less important than the third reason, which really should be the first reason. And it's this. Because immersion is a picture of what uh, of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, as well as our death to old, our old self and arising to newness of life. So again, if it is a public proclamation, because we don't believe that baptism, what, what says, or what's called confers grace, or that somebody's saved through baptism, that it's a public proclamation of something that already happened inside. And baptism more perfectly pictures that. We're standing in the water, our old sinful self. We go under as a death and we come up to newness of life. That's why we baptize the way that we do. Say, well, should we baptize in the building or in the river? It depends on you and how much you like cold water. <laughs> you know, one of the great blessings of the modern era is that not only do we have indoor plumbing, but we also have indoor heating for that plumbing. <laughs> hey, I gotta tell you, Having been in some cold water in my life, it's nice to be able to warm that puppy up. I got no problems with that whatsoever. Well, next question that people often ask is who should be baptized? Maybe that's the most important question. Is who should be baptized? Well, you know, I, I already referenced this story a little bit, but let's look at it a little bit more closely in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, we see a very interesting story as Philip, Philip, one of the early deacons of the church, is called by God to go to Gaza. And he doesn't know why he has to go to Gaza, he just goes to Gaza. And suddenly as he gets down to Gaza, there's a man sitting on a chariot. And this man happens to be from Ethiopia. Ethiopia, the country in Africa. And this man, it says he was a, he was a god fear. That meant that he was either Jewish or he was interested in the Jewish God. And so he, he must have been in Jerusalem. And as he's going back to Ethiopia, he's reading the scroll of Isaiah. But like with many people, he doesn't understand what he's reading. <clears throat> and so Philip asks him if he understands what he's reading. And he says, how can I? Nobody's here to show me. And so Philip sees an opening. And he sits down and he, he not only tells him about what Isaiah was saying, but he tells him more importantly who Isaiah was pointing to, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his opening to tell him about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the man comes to faith, and he's the first person from the continent of Africa who we know beyond a shadow of a doubt trusted Jesus as Savior. Look at what it says in verse 36 of Acts chapter 8. It says, And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. What prevents me from being baptized? You know, the only thing preventing someone from being baptized is belief on the Lord Jesus Christ. We put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to be baptized. All believers should be baptized. So the question I get a lot of times is, what about children? Should children be baptized? And my answer to that is, it depends. A lot of things in life comes down to, it depends, right? It depends. Some children should be baptized if they've trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Some should wait until they get to the point where they actually can trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
I found that that's been particularly challenging in, in, in a family like mine. My children have been in church not since birth, since conception. My kids have been in church all of their existence. In fact, I would probably argue that my kids have been in church about as long as just about anybody. Because they've been in for a long time. Even my seven-year-old has been in church a lot. She probably doesn't have too many Sundays where she say she wasn't in church. Church-going kids can have some challenges because they can answer a lot of the questions. That doesn't necessarily mean their heart's in the right place. So whenever I have a child who comes to faith in Jesus, I'm excited. But I meet with them. And typically I'll meet with them two or three times. And what I'll do is I'll ask them some questions. Because I want to discern, is this child ready yet to follow Jesus through the baptismal waters? Or are they just saying things? I've had children before that will, will, will say they want to be baptized, but the main reason they want to be baptized is because they want to participate in the Lord's Supper. Somebody's eating at church, and they want to be part of it. So again, it's my responsibility as a pastor to discern, is this child at the point where they're ready, where they really understand, or are they just saying what they think I want to hear? And you know, honestly, it's challenging. It's difficult. But baptism to me is, is such an important experience in the life of the church that I want to make sure that those who understand, or who are baptized, understand why they're being baptized. Now, does that mean that they're going to understand the theology around baptism? No. I'm not expecting that a child who comes and talks to me about baptism is going to give me a big picture of what soteriology means. In fact, if I met with a child who could tell me what soteriology meant, I'd be shocked. I'm not expecting them to speak like a, a theologian. But I want to make sure that they know. That's why we don't baptize infants. There's no reason to baptize an infant or a child who doesn't come to know Jesus as Savior because they haven't come to that point yet. Say, well, well, don't they need to be cleansed of original sin? No, the only thing that cleanses from our sin, original or anything else, is the death of Jesus Christ. Is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what cleanses. Say, well, what happens with children then? God will take care of them. I tell you, as somebody who has lost a child, I find great comfort in knowing them. That God will take care of that. God will deal with that. That's not my business. Quite frankly, nobody's salvation is my business. That's between them and God. My business is to profess, is to tell the truth. Say, well, what do we do with babies then? Well, one of the things that I really encourage families to do is to do, ba to, to do baby and even children dedications. Some people get to the point where they're like, well, I, wanna, I, I want this child to follow Jesus. And so they'll ask me, should we baptize them? I say, no, we shouldn't baptize them, but we should do a dedication. And a dedication is an important part, an important part of the life of the church. It's an opportunity for, for, for usually parents to come forward with their children, again, whether it be an infant or an older child, and say, I want to raise this child in the way of the Lord. And so they're committing to raising the child in the way of the Lord, but they're also asking you to help them with that. When somebody comes into this church and they have children, we have a responsibility. And that responsibility is to help them know the things of the Lord. Some of the folks who come into the church with children have a pretty good understanding of, the, of God's Word. Many of them don't. You might think, well, I don't know God's Word that well. Guess what? We're going to have people that come in that know it less than you do. So you have something you can share. It's one of the things I love about VBS. We've got kids that come in from VBS who are church kids. And we've got other kids who don't even know what church is. And everything in between. We have a responsibility to be able to help them to understand. And we can be involved in that. And that's what a dedication is about. It's about saying, we as the church are committing to help this person as this person takes on their responsibility to raise the child in the way of the Lord. So throughout Scripture, we see believers following Jesus through the baptismal waters. They did this because Jesus commanded it. Because Jesus gave an example of it. 
because they want to demonstrate that they believe and they want to proclaim to everyone that they're a follower of Jesus. And that's why we too should be baptized. To follow Jesus' example. To follow Jesus' command. To demonstrate that you truly do believe what went on inside you. And to proclaim the world that you do believe. And to proclaim to the church that you need help in your growth. So the last question I'll ask is this. What prevents you from following Jesus through the baptismal waters? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your grace. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to baptize and to celebrate baptism. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who has not followed you through the baptism waters, that they would do that. And Lord, for the rest of us, Lord, I pray that we would have now a good grounded understanding of what baptism is all about so that we could help others to know and help others to see the options that they have when it comes to whether it be dedicating children or following him through the baptismal waters. Help us to be able to, to, to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ so that we would see many come to faith. Lord, help us to make disciples to baptize those disciples, and to teach those disciples. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.